While I sip my coffee and um, tell you slightly a bit more about myself, I'd like to point people who are following online to this URL, slideshare.net stroke Maria Walters, where I've put the slides for the talk today. The reason for that is um, actually an illustration of what kind of human computer interaction I do. So the kind of human computer interaction I do is rooted very much in ergonomics and human factors. So I'm interested in um, what makes it easy for people to do things. And I've noticed from watching some of the talks from up in Edinburgh that sometimes, especially when slides are quite busy, um, they can get a bit jumbled in uh, transmission. So if you're not here physically and want to see the slides clearly, go to the slide share. Okay. So why would a researcher in HCI be interested in data science and somebody who doesn't do infovis or data vis? Strange, isn't it? Well, I'm interested in, um, as, as was already said in the introduction, in the data generation processes, because data generation usually requires people interacting with a piece of technology, you know, actually wearing an activity tracker, actually charging an activity tracker, to looking after an activity tracker. And that's what I'm interested in looking at. So, the talk has uh, three parts. First of all, I'm going to tell you a bit how I found my interest in missing data, and that's from my interest in uh, e-mental health, technology to support mental health. Then I will explain my approach by talking a bit about activity trackers, and I think that will fit in quite well with what uh, Mirka is going to talk about later. Um, and uh, last but not least, because this is a fellow short talk, I'll explain a bit about collaborating across the Turing and what kinds of collaborations I'm interested in. I found the Turing really, really good for establishing collaboration, so that's going to be my final part. So missing data, very informally, Missing data is about observations that we would like to be there or that should be there, but are not there. So in the health context, it's people who haven't input their readings, people who've left their activity trackers at home, people who haven't shown up to appointments. <laughs> the statistical treatment has mostly been focused on getting, finding a way to get those missing values from the values that are there. So imputing the values. To that end, researchers have to find three different types of missing values. Values that are missing completely at random. That's relatively easy because we can leave them out, impute them very easily. Values that can be predicted from existing data and most of the approaches that we've got in the literature are about, are about that. Um, and also, bane of people's lives, missing data that are not predictable from existing data. And that's the kind of data that I'm interested in, and that's where I think the data generation processes can come in. Because there is something about the variable where observations are missing itself that makes those observations go missing. So my goal in that research is, first of all, to investigate why data goes missing. That sounds pretty wooly. But there are two very um, concrete ways of going about this. One is qualitatively talking to people to understand why those data go missing and then quantitatively doing statistical modeling to feed into data analysis and visualization solutions. So the way I work, if you look me up in the faculty fellow directory, you'll find that I sit on the applications end, right? So I'm very much applied. And what I do is I look at relevant aspects of data generation and then I try to uh, build a picture from a multidisciplinary perspective. I'll illustrate later on what that looks like with the activity trackers. And then I take that understanding to statisticians and data scientists to create an interesting model that actually converges. Now, those of you who are statisticians in the audience will have pricked up their ears at the word converges, because that means a lot of judicious stripping out of the complexity 
that has been uncovered in stage one because the bugger needs to converge, right? So, but based on the understanding I've got from stage one, uh, I can then talk to the statistician and say, okay, so where can we cut? Where can we simplify? And then also the overview of the simplifications we make goes into the understanding of what that model actually tells us. Okay, so that's, that's basically how I propose to work and collaborate within the Turing. And that's also why well, it's quite nice to have people at every level. So statisticians doing fundamental work. From, so right from the statisticians who do fundamental work, straight down to people who are doing applications of data science, but maybe in fields that are different from health. So the origin story. Why I'm interested in data generation processes. Started out with an EU project called Help for Mood. If you want to look it up online, it's help for the number mood.eu. And it looked at supporting the treatment of people with depression in the community. So in e-mental health, you very often have um, a line of thought that looks at therapy solutions, right? So somebody takes an existing therapy um, and then uh, implements it in a package. And then that package, uh, people have to work through this. Help for Mood was different. It was a self-monitoring so solution that also allowed people to do some sort of therapy homework, like reflecting on their thought patterns. The approach we took to the monitoring was that depression is very much a change relative to an individual baseline. So if somebody is very quiet, but becomes even quieter, or suddenly becomes quite, um, quite agitated with anger and frustration, those are both changes from the baseline that we need to detect and then see whether through treatment, a person can go back to their baseline. So what we did was we did some activity monitoring using an actigraph. We looked at monitoring of mood and thought patterns and psychomotor symptoms. I'm not going to talk too much about this um, because I've only got 25 minutes, but if you're interested, the reference is on the slide and the slide share. And we also had, in addition to the daily monitoring, weekly one-page reports to clinicians. So the assumption was very much that we were in a closed loop and that the sense making, pe people would make sense of the data that was recorded together with their clinician. So that the clinician could see, you know, how's the recovery going? We ended the project with the usual pilot randomized controlled trial. We had people with major depressive disorder diagnosed with a standard SCID, um, um, standard SCID um, interview. They were asked to use Help for Mood for four weeks every day. Remember these two words, every day. They will come back to bite us later. And we had the usual background measures and qualitative interviews. Now, what were the actual usage patterns? We had 14 people who were treatment as usual and 13 who actually used help for mood. I can go into the reasons for those low numbers later. There are some very typical and interesting recruitment issues with uh, recruiting people into um, trials of depression. Nobody had formally tracked or measured their mood before, but interestingly enough, when he asked them, have you ever tracked your mood? They would say, yes, but mentally. So tracking for that population very much meant introspection. And then daily. D did anybody use it daily? No, they didn't. Even though we asked them to. And even though people in pilot case studies were quite happy to almost use it daily. Instead, it was used mainly two to three times a week. Why did that happen? Now, there are loads of reasons for that, some of which have to do with the way that Health for Mood was implemented. But another reason that came through quite clearly in the, um, in the interviews was something that we in the human-computer interaction community call appropriation. 
which means that you give people a piece of technology, you give people the manual, you tell people what to do with them, and then they do something completely different with it. Right? So this, this clicker here, what I'm doing is I'm not just using it to, um, to scan through the slides, but I also have it in my hand to make points and to hang on to it. Okay, so I'm appropriating the clicker for these purposes. And that appropriation was exactly what happened with Help for Mood. And that appropriation was actually quite powerful in explaining the usage patterns we saw. This is what one of our participants told, told us. And what you see here is that they used Help for Mood not just as monitoring, but also very much as a coping strategy. So they went in to reflect on their mood. For some of them, that meant that they only went in if they felt that they were strong enough to reflect on their mood. For others, it meant that they went in when they were feeling particularly low and felt that they would benefit from a reflection of their mood. Some, some of them told us, we don't want to use it every day. We want to be able to use it twice a day, if we feel like it. Okay, because the act of using the system affected them. Okay, so that's why I became interested in that data generation process. Because if you translate it to a statistical variable, what you've got is you have, did they use the system, yes or no? One, zero. So that process is not just a linear process with a few missing pieces here and there, but that's a process where the missing values are actually tied into what people use the system for. And that's why I became interested in investigating this aspect of missing data, both from a quantitative point of view, looking at the patterns that we do see, and then also from a qualitative point of view, which is talking to the people who generate the data to understand why I'm seeing the patterns I'm seeing. This would have obviously changed how we uh, designed Help for Mood 2, Help for Mood 1. The design was essentially fixed in 2011. A lot changed since 2011 and 2014 when the trial was done and Help for Mood 2 never came about. So moving on from Help for Mood to the kind of work that uh, I started at the Turing in the summer in one of the small groups. So we looked at activity tracking, and that's with Henry Potts, who's uh, just down the road at the far on UCL, and with Katarzyna Stavarsh, who's now in Bristol. So we looked at what potential processes are involved in the use of an activity tracker. And can I ask you how many of you actually have an activity tracker like Fitbit, Jawbone? How many of you have one? Okay, one. That's really interesting. Yes. So how, how many how many have uh, the trackers on their phones? Well, we might have it, but we never use it. Okay. So, um, so we've got one that has an additional tracker around five or six who have a tracker on their phone, track themselves that way, and then we have might have it, but who cares? Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, very interestingly, when I asked this question to uh, an audience of design informatics students, the only two people who had, a, uh, who had a tracker in that room were the uh, co-director of design informatics in Edinburgh and somebody who developed, um, uh, who developed trackers for a living. The students didn't have them. However, when I asked the very same question at the Scottish Mental Health Network conference, 20 people have trackers, quite a few. And uh, some people had trackers that they only used when they did sports. And when I asked people who had uh, phones that could be used for tracking, see if hands went up. Okay, so you have different populations with different attitudes and different baselines for tracking. Is it because trackers are expensive? Uh, it could be because trackers are expensive. But you know, I, I don't I don't think so. Because these days trackers are eighty quid. 
20 quid. I mean, the, the, the very simple clip-on, very simple clip-on Fitbit jawbone, 40, 50. That's, I mean, that's, that's one reason. But if you look at, if you look at the literature in human computer interaction that has studied these things, a lot of this is because the trackers don't fit into their lives or because there is a problem with the tracker. And that's what I mean with the multidisciplinary approach, because one of the um, unusual suspects for understanding why people use objective trackers might well be material science. So going forward a bit, so this is somebody who loves, who loves her Fitbit, right? She tracked her experiences with a Fitbit in a blog, but after 10 months, the Fitbit looked a bit like this, right? So she patched it up with, um, <clears throat> she, she patched it up with tape. And there are even um, solutions for not losing your Fitbit, additional ones. So, I mean, you have to be very dedicated, very dedicated Fitbit user if your Fitbit does this to you after 10 months to then walk around uh, with tape. Okay, but that's, that's, basically, that's basically material science. So material science is one thing. Then um, another thing that would go into a detailed user model would be job. If you're a nurse or a doctor, can you go around with something on your wrist? No. Fit with ulterior need. I haven't gotten the data, but I think that activity tracker sales will take off dramatically in uh, early January 2017, which is when people think, I want to make a change. And it also needs to, uh, needs to fit into other user characteristics, such as illness or external stress. There's a very interesting study in the journal of the uh, American Medical Informatics Association, which did not involve people using Fitbits for a research study, but you know, just, just for themselves, just to support their, li their lives. They had healthy subjects and subjects with chronic, chronic illnesses, several chronic illnesses at a time. But they were given these. Also in the HCI studies that I quoted, people were given the trackers. And in the um, Medical Informatics Association study, the people who were ill stopped using them quite quickly because they couldn't cope with what it took to look after it. And um, in the Facebook feeds of my friends who use activity trackers, I, I get help. My Fitbit's fallen down the sofa. Lots of, lots of things like that, especially with the, with the small clip-on ones. So all of, all of these things matter when we look at why we're not getting activity tracker data. And that's why I was talking about a multidisciplinary approach earlier. Now, this is some of the scoping I've done. The way this can work across the Turing Institute, uh, let me give you a brief overview of some of the formal, more formal collaborations that I've um, that I've entered into. So, um, Mirko, hi Mirko. Um, we'll be working with Jackie and Richard and the Radar CNS team. And um, also, I'm currently revising for resubmission um, an application together with John Crowcroft from Cambridge and his PhD students here, looking at the use of uh, data from the hub of all things for looking at wearables. There's also paper and grant writing groups. Again, what came from the, um, the uh, using the connections that came from the small group. Uh, the Turing Institute is talking to the FAR, which is not just down in London, but all across the UK about uh, healthcare data, analyzing healthcare data, big, da big data analytics approaches for healthcare data. Um, I've also been working with uh, Scott Hale you had a internship program this summer, taking some of that work forward. And, um, you know, in general, I've got my availability online. 
I'm mostly located in Edinburgh, so do come up to Edinburgh. We have dedicated rooms for cheering fellows. We have great coffee machines um, and lovely views of Arthur's seat. These are my contact details. And um, if you want to, um, if you ever want to bribe me, my preferred coffees are espresso macchiato, espresso cortado.